I will I start it. again uh, uh, recording. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we are back to the discussion. Oh, sorry. Now I'm sharing the camera. Uh, you have to pick the one with the slides. The, yes. Good. So let's take one minute and let's think group one, the case of Eric uh, teaching in Uppsala. Who had group one and uh, this weather station network and uh, giving information to a company? What would you say? Somebody for group one that can take the floor, open mm -hmm. the microphone. Okay, Ikasi, go ahead. Okay, <laughs> just write it down, but <laughs> just tell somebody to take the microphone. Okay. Eva, when, for example, now, uh, do you see my presentation? Uh, do you still see the exercise vignette or do you see another tab? No, no I see seeing the vignette. Yeah, we see the slides, but but not in full mode, just the, the, the slides in, in Google Docs. Actually, okay. they have the link, so, okay, good, here you are, good. Okay, and and you, so I'm moving to another tab now, do you still see my slide with a case? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I want to see the chat, so they're saying group one i got group one however okay we think this citizen science is found in commercial service like okay but you the question is would you call this citizen science yes or no mm -hmm. sorry uh, can you hear, hear me yes, yes rebecca yes i'm rebecca from the group one sorry nasi i think that is uh, faster if uh, someone of us can speak. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, we said that uh, it's, of course, a citizen uh, science initiative. And we thought that it's a, a, like a win win relationship. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, these uh, people can uh, keep on their hobbies or their passions. And the entity can win and make a commercial services. For me, the, the point mm -hmm. is um, how to deal with the commercial service. Um, yeah. You know, you are uh, taking the, the data from people and, and you are earn money. So the, the, the point for me is to, to regulate this kind yes. of activity yes in, in the best way. Yeah, you, you mentioned the, the keyword the, thank you yes so i i won't go deeper on this but yes this is a kind of citizen science and that's an issue about the data and the companies and the commercial use of this so we will keep it like aside but yes you did it perfectly well with the exercise and we will move to the next one so group two so would you call this citizen science, the, the case of Jane, that she gives uh, money to a bird watch program? Very quickly, so we can finish in four minutes and uh, with all this, and I move forward the last 10 minutes. Well, we, we yes didn't or no? Agree. Well, we didn't agree. Mm -hmm. um, some of us think it, it's only support, supporting citizen science, but not uh, participating herself and some of us think it was a, a kind of participation on citizen yeah i think it is yeah, so only su supporting citizen science and not real involvement yes so for for your for your knowledge uh, may, mostly the people were several people answering this survey they they the ones that did that say they wouldn't call this citizen science really because she's not she's as you said pro supporting a group that is doing citizen science but she is not uh, doing it and um, she would call her contribution as citizen science itself great thank you the case of femke 
teaching uh, assistant in Eindhoven, the Netherlands, and uh, this helping astronomers in classifying images of galaxies. Would you call this citizen science? Somebody with a microphone that is quicker? Okay, it's written already. <laughs> and uh, they say, group three, we think. Yes, exactly. Yeah, you're right. This is a very clear case of citizen science. Group four, Jax and uh, this gaming group and working with galaxies. You say yes or no? Well, we said yes, a few discussion discussion here. Uh, it's a kind of win-win. Someone is classified, is helping to classify and get some credits for the game. And it's very funny also for the people who like the game. So yes, clearly yes, the win-win. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, also most of the people agree that this was a case of citizen science. Thank you. What about this one, the one that uh, Dorota, a photographer who's providing with pictures and a group of photographers as well to an ecologist at the university. And then getting this data pro published and supporting environmental management. Group five. Well, um as we talked, uh, we all agree that it was uh, a way of uh, sitting in silence. Um, uh, since we, the people uh, were contributing uh, with public authorities uh, in supporting the environment by uh, collecting data, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And the last two cases about the uh, Janis, the bus driver in Greece, who was providing his uh, data um, via um, this app report. Hello, can you Group hear six? me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I don't know if someone from my group wants to talk. Uh, we think that these kind of issues related with health medical uh, researches are a bit tricky because there's this risk of transforming a person in a simple object of scientific investigation. But then according to the case, I think this can be called uh, citizen science, uh, but this is my personal view uh, in the sense that this initiative um, is volunteer based um, and I think uh, this person is engaging in the process of making science because he, he need to um, use this app to report his symptoms several times. So I think he has the knowledge that this uh, that he is participating in this study. And at the end, is also it's also mentioned that the results will be published in an open access journal. So I think the, uh, here there's a true engagement that can be related with citizen science. Yeah, here the visions were shared, but most of the people didn't consider this citizen science because uh, they say, well, the driver is just using the app and providing his his uh, tract of, uh, of blood sugar and things like that, but he's not really understanding this. We don't have information about the type of uh, research and they are using their data. So it's like the very basic and actually in in, in these times we, we question this level, we don't consider really this as a level of engagement. It's just like a citizens as sensors, the very, very basic one. But yeah, think, uh, I think visions are, are shared in this case, but mostly we would say no, it's not really citizen science, it's more providing data, which we want to move uh, the level of engagement further. Yes, and I, I'm sorry, yes. I think maybe the, the problem is the, the fact that we didn't consider, at least I did not consider this, maybe he didn't have the knowledge that by sharing these data, he was participating in this study, maybe he was just doing this because the doctor told him to do it. So I think this yes. may this was yes, maybe also, a question. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the I I can't say exactly with the info, but if, from the information provided, we don't know really that. Okay, thank you very much. And the last one, uh, the hobby gardener. What uh, does uh, Group Seven think? It all say you have already written, but please take the microphone because it was a discussion here. Uh, sorry, I think there are lots of noise here. I cannot uh, speak so uh, clearly, you know? <laughs> so I write in the chat. So you consider it or not? Uh, no. Okay, Natalia, you can team in too because the discussion was about Firo okay. said and Natalia. And um, well, Firo said just writ written down, have written down what she thinks. Mm -hmm. And then Natalia, you can team in if you want to. Hello. Yes, I think it is a uh, experience of citizen science because uh, Sebastian participated the the whole process, no? He he uh, make data, he analyzed, he he participated the includes the 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 paper. Mhm. Mm I think yeah, that's... here, mm -hmm, yeah, you, you, you're right, and the, most of the people, um, they consider, yes, exactly, they, they do consider this as a case of citizen science. Okay, thank you very much. That was a, a nice exercise. So I will stop sharing this one, and I will share this new slide. So to finish my presentation, the minutes I have left, I will briefly show you that the these all these actions and this uh, uh, research and way of researching has impacted the landscape of science. So the academic publications about citizen science have raised during the last 20 years. Also the, the citizen science is considered in other working frameworks like the SDGs are now citizen science is an important way of making tangible contributions and also for environmental studies mainly but not only they are really being part of so you see on the on my slide Ebert at Art Portal and iNaturalist they are citizen science observatories and that's a whole new world that I won't touch in this presentation, but they are providing data for get, give so for for seeing trends and for really progressing the the research in environment and also into environmental policy. So we we are considering data coming from citizen science. Also, the the fact that so many people uh, are being involved from academia and from non-academia spaces uh, have uh, led to create these new communities of practice. So this is um, a picture where you can see many different uh, associations and networks. Also, conference and meetings uh, are being uh, organized yearly in different parts of the world. Academic journals are publishing about citizen science. There are publications, so there, there are books, articles, papers, and beyond academia, we can see a trend that is always racing in the in the browsers and searching citizen science is, is always going up. And citizen science is appearing on media, on the really mainstream media, not only the scientific one. And the, an example I, I share here, newspapers, a podcast about citizen science. There was a film, a series of episodes in the United States, The Crowd and the Cloud, and you can watch it online. So as a summary, citizen science has a, a, a history and the, and, the, and the development of it has been very impacted by the social and technological trends. So there is like a race and a modern citizen science. And please keep in mind that it's a wide concept that includes uh, many different activities and it's gaining recognition among the public and among, among scientists as well. 
this is a very, um, because Eva asked, asked me how to involve citizens in a citizen science project, and it's, this is also a course on its own. It would be a training on its own, but I think this slide really summarizes the very different steps before you start and the first, very first steps and how to develop further a citizen science project. So you will, you will see that all these steps are really uh, useful and meaningful, and uh, the link is there, so the guide to citizen science, so you can find really good literature about this. For getting more resources, I truly encourage you to go to our uh, EU Citizen Science platform and register. So there will be um, here, I will click on it, you will see. Now we are having a citizen science event, a policy event next Tuesday. So I also invite you to go to to the link and register it's a uh, we will have uh, people from the ministry of spain and portugal and talking about their stake in citizen science and the value they give it and also there are other representatives of ministries all over europe so it's, it's very important to hear these conversations and also to show this this group of uh, stakeholders that we are very interested so as as, as uh, i really I invite you to come to the event. You can participate in Zoom by registering or you can follow it on YouTube. You will find all the information in this platform. But also on this platform you can register here so you can create your profile. And, uh, and by doing that then you can, for example, make your own library and submit projects to showcase them here or resources. It's really a, a very rich place to, to share citizen science resources, projects, and tools. And you can also get, uh, you will get informed by, uh, of events happening in this field. And the platform is really, uh, it's been a collaborative project running for the last three years. We, as a platform, we are almost finished. At the end of this year, we finished the project of creating this platform, but the platform will stay for hopefully forever. And it really, we have put a lot of effort to show the people who will use the platform to show you that e-citizen science generates connections between many different groups of stakeholders and that the platform was made by the community of citizen scientists and for the community. And it really, we want to create an impact in the quality of citizen science. The things that are part of this platform are really curated. It's not like you can upload anything. You, when you upload there, you go through a process of quality insurance, insurance, and then you will get your project or resource published there. It's also, um, it complies with the FAIR principles of data management. It has a European dimension, and it can also connect with other networks and platforms. So it's, a, it's really a very nice effort. And the last slides, I. I wanted to share with you two links that are related to open science. And uh, these are one of my favorite uh, science magazines. So Horis Horizons from, from Switzerland. Here it's, it's a very nice article saying uh, open data seeks for citizens for a serious relationship. And the other link, it's a, a magazine that unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. It's called a technologist. It was a very nice magazine made by a consortium of universities. But here, if you go to the website, every all the articles are archived, which is amazing. And if you write, if you type here "open science," there are several um, resources that and articles where you you can really see different scopes and different angles for for open science. So this is uh, something I wanted to share with you. Here is a, this is a, what I was just showing you, and an invitation to jump into this uh, super nice landscape and complex and of course with challenges. Uh, I prepared a Padlet, so if you go to the jump to this, here you will find different resources. So websites, videos that talk about citizen science, fundamental short readings, the characteristics and the principles. SDGs and citizen science, some webinars, the books that are open source, projects that we find very interesting, 
some citizen science in uh, not about uh, beyond Europe in Latin America as well social sciences and citizen science inspiration web web resources and EU projects that are currently going on and then of course to go deeper to go to our platform to register there and to go to EXA website and that's it thank you very much for your attention thank and you for so being much. here such an amazing uh, presentation. Seven, when I saw 70 slides, I say, oh my gosh, it's not going to happen in one hour. And then the breakout session, but I think it has been perfect because what you, what you gave to the PhD students is just a threat to just keep going and, and keep uh, uh, deepening in the, in the citizen science research. And also uh, considering that more and more is an aspect that is going to be a valuable, a, a, a valuable, and in the valuation of the of the European projects uh, involving citizens and making science with and for society. But uh, just in, instead of ha having a discussion now with the students, I will just uh, invite uh, Ancho and Belen, that they are our next speakers, that they are themselves researchers at the university. Uh, you are an expert in citizen science. They are experts in their field. And they will tell us how they have been implementing citizen science techniques and approaches in their own research. So Ancho Sanchez is a um, full professor in our university. Uh, he's a, a mathematician and, and a very interesting uh, human being to talk to with. <laughs> so I think he will transmit his own experience and applying citizen science uh, in, in his research. Uh, Ancho, when you want, the floor is yours. Um, keep it as sweet uh, as, as you Thank can. You, and we uh, just, uh, for the record, I'm a theoretical physicist, not a mathematician. Please. Sorry. Sorry about that. I didn't, I was trying to don't read your CV and make you know a bin. So, <laughs> woo -hoo. Okay. So, I'll. Uh, See if I can share my screen. Uh, I also have a ceiling on slides, but don't worry, because it will go very fast. Mm, it's this one here. So you should be seeing uh, my uh, presentation now. Yes, thank you. Okay, okay excellent. So um, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for being here. And thank you, Andrea, for your very nice introduction, which will allow me to really rush over my first uh, slides. What I'm going to tell you is the experience of a theoretical physicist, as I said, working on complex system science and trying to do that on a social science context. So it's it's kind of uh, crazy, but I, I, I hope you'll follow. So uh, briefly, first things I've done on this field were what, what we decided were not really citizen science, which is using citizens as data provided. And I'll, I'll do that in, in economics labs. I ask them uh, questions about what they want to do with their money. I give them uh, money as a function of what they do. And I just record their decisions on that money. And this is a very simple example in which you just tell them to people, you have this money and uh, you don't, uh, uh, you, you can share it with this other person. What do you do? And then you see that. Lots of people give half of it, even if they don't need to do anything. Or so, but uh, that's that's just okay. But that's data providing, and I, I won't really uh, spend a lot of time here. This is where it's done. This kind of thing. So it's a little bit more complicated than than providing data just by wearing a sensor. But it's not a lot more than that. People interact with these computers. Uh, this is an experiment going on. And we can also do it in, in the middle of, uh, of uh, other sets, what we call lab in the field. We take tablets out and we ask for people to participate. Like uh, here, this is a kind of interface we use. And we found all kinds of people can play, uh, can take part in our experiment. Or you can even do it with, with wine. So it's, it's very rewarding, but it's not really citizen science. Okay. So let me describe my experience more on a citizen science uh, line. And that would be the studies we do about how we organize our uh, relationships, our friendships. And here I'm talking real friendships, not not just uh, uh, Facebook or Twitter or, or all that uh, crap because that's not real friendship. 
So this is uh, friendships uh, in real life, okay? And uh, our work uh, from the scientific viewpoint uh, arises from the ideas of Robin Dunbar, who is uh, also a co-worker of us. He basically had two main ideas. One was to think that if you fit uh, the size of our neocortex, which is a part of our brain, to the group size typical of different species of primates, that predicts that humans should have a typical group size of about 150. And that has become known as Dunbar's number. That's generically referred to as the number of friends you could have. Uh, it's a very popular thing. It's, there's a lot of discussion about it. I mean, this is a, like an average, you know, but some people can have uh, hundreds of friends and some people can have uh, only tens of friends. It's just for guidance. What you cannot have is 10,000 friends. But then there are different types of friends, and that's what really interests me. So another thing Dunbar came up with is the idea that our friendships are structured in these circles I'm showing here, in which you see uh, there's a very uh, reduced number of very good friends or family or whatever. That's the first circle. Then there's a second circle, including the first one, in which you have really good friends. Then you have friends, so there's the third circle. And then up to this numbers number, you have, well, people you know, you meet every now and then, but, but you, I mean, perhaps it's better to call them acquaintances. There are studies showing that there's further circles, uh, at least one, and uh, I think, no, I, I don't have the slide with me here, but uh, it's a group in Barcelona who showed that in Spain, the size of this circle is about 600. So you see there's a kind of nice scaling, like uh, the circles grow by a factor of approximately three and whatnot. And this is all empirical. This has been found empirical. And funnily enough, it has also been shown to be true in Facebook or Twitter. So if you want to know more about that, uh, Robin himself has just put out this very nice uh, book and uh, summarizing all his uh, work in the past two decades about this. But that, that's not what I want to do now. What I'm thinking of, is that I want to see how this evolves in time. And that's very little that's known about that. So questions like what's the lifetime of relationships and how it depends on age or whatever, it's what we want to look at. And then to do this, we went to, uh, to schools. Okay, and this is one uh, high school in Madrid we have worked with. Uh, and there, who are the citizen science scientists? It's basically the teachers that works with us not the students that will be giving us the data. And I'll be more clear about this in a moment. But here, the people that are really citizen scientists are the teachers, OK? So what do we do? We work closely with the teachers. There's a coordinator in the high school. In fact, he's a co-author of our last paper. But then there's a feedback on the results we get from the students because we want to understand what uh, changes in friendships come from interventions and what not and what new questions may can have, uh, all kinds of things. And also, we have a visualization tool to give teachers uh, to uh, allow them to understand the data and act them in, in better working with their courses, OK? So this is the kind of the results we get. These are a class of, uh, this is a, in the first year in high school. This is our five classes. And these are the average of the first and the second uh, Circles. They just uh, have. We have this app in which we ask them about uh, whom they are friends with in the high school, and among them, who are, are the uh, best friends. We also ask them about bad relationships, but they're less. Although I'll say something about that in a second. So this is another example of, of uh, the same stuff, and this is uh, something we've looked at. It, it turns out from a theory we have that the structure I told you about the circles is the typical one. But then there's another structure in which you have very possible people to make friends with, and then all of them are in circle one, which is this one here. This is strange, but we observe that in circles of uh, migrants uh, in which they have a different language or whatever. So we also track the evolution of these uh, the structures from, from one survey in October to another survey in, in May, and we see that most groups go through an increase of this parameter, which means less uh, less uh, close relationship groups and more open with the 
less intense friendship, but open to more people. But there are some groups in which this doesn't happen. And we've discussed this with the teachers and try to uh, see what's going on there. There's, uh, this is uh, more data I'm going to skip now. And this is uh, very interesting because it shows how when they enter high school, they are still highly influenced from their, uh, their primary school, the one they come from. So when you depict the relationship and uh, with this algorithm, people that have uh, more close communities get more together. You see that even if it's not perfectly uh, ordered there, you see the effect of the, the, the school of origin, and this takes long to go away. Okay? Now, this is one tool we give the, the teachers. Here we show on the vertical axis for each group uh, the bad relationships, and on the uh, horizontal axis, the good relationships. So they can immediately identify students that may be uh, having problems consistently in the two surveys. Notice that here there are numbers. We as researchers, we don't know the names of these uh, students, but they as teachers can access the names and they act actually action to prevent, for instance, these guys having these very many bad relations. Okay. Now, this is another interesting thing. This is a comparison of the number of relations they have with uh, students of the same sex uh, or the same gender or whatever. And uh, there's something funny about group E. You see it changes a lot from December to May. And it turns out that this happened because the teacher allowed them to change it every two weeks. And after a while, he allowed them to change freely. And that increased the homophily in relationships that arises uh, just uh, normally uh, among students 12, 13 year olds. They prefer to be more with the, have to be friends more with people of their own gender. So this is an example of how an intervention can be evaluated by looking at our data, okay? And uh, uh, finally, this is uh, just another uh, picture to show you that this high school, which is uh, divided in two uh, lines, one in English and one in Spanish, has the group in English in both surveys clearly separated from the group in Spanish. So even if they are in the same high school, it's like you are having two high schools together. This is even more clear here. This is very recent data. So this is the, uh, the groups, first year, second year, third year, the ones who are English speaking and the ones who are Spanish speaking. And finally, we also identify a situation in which classes which are not gender balanced, like this one here, uh, in which there are uh, 20, 20 girls, uh, end up with two girls with two groups formed almost exclusively by girls. And that happens because the size of the group of girls is too large in terms of the Dunbar circle. And interestingly, this happens, you detect this when you ask them about their uh, bad relationships. Otherwise, our analysis would show them as a single group. Okay, so that's basically what I wanted to tell you. And my main message is that, that all the progress we're doing here is because we are working with the teachers. These are the real citizen scientists. We have sessions with them and discuss their results, understand them better. And they are really providing us with a lot of input. And I think that's what my contribution should be. So I'll stop here and just finish making uh, a small ad about a friend run by uh, very, uh, a school run by a very good friend of mine in Barcelona by Josep Perejo and uh, the people of this other European project. And if you're interested in citizen social science, it's, this is a very good place to start. Thank you very much. I think I'm in time. Perfect. Perfect timing and a perfect example of how to deal with the citizen science experience in their mm -hmm. real research. A very good uh, example. Uh, so let's move on with uh, Anna, that she's also a researcher of the Politecnica mm -hmm. University of Madrid. And she discovers uh, open science. She got in love with open science and she really engaged with citizens in her own research. Let's uh, listen to Anna Belen that she will tell us about the Greco experience, which is a project that just recently uh, finished uh, at the end of May. And I was very happy to be part of the advisory board of that amazing project that I learned a lot. And also she will tell the big news. Go ahead, Belen. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Eva. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Hello? Oops. Yes, yes, we can see yes. it. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva. 
Well, what I want just to comment uh, today is um, my field of research, that is uh, uh, the application of open science for a sunny future, because uh, I'm working on photovoltaics. For those of you who don't really know uh, what is uh, photovoltaics, because it's very technical, very engineering uh, field, uh, what we are uh, doing is taking advantage from the sunlight and convert this energy into electricity, okay? It's electricity, the conversion in electricity is not thermal. This is another kind of energy. So um, what, uh, my, uh, what I started three years ago uh, was a project, the Greco project that has ended 15 days ago, 15 days ago uh, in order to demonstrate um, how open science can be integrated in a research project, in any research project, we uh, made the example in, in photovoltaics, but open science is just a rational. Um, what we demonstrated is uh, um, how uh, the, the open science can be integrated, but uh, not only that open science is a methodology, but it's a very powerful tool for all of us working on technology to exploit our research output and have a larger impact with our own research activity. Uh, within this project, uh, we decided to uh, um, investigate on uh, citizen science. And uh, this is our product, this is Generation Solar, uh, that I'm going to present uh, to you today. Uh, of course, uh, Generation Solar is available uh, in Apple Store and also in, in Android. What we decided to, to what did we decide to, to start a citizen science in photovoltaics? Well, um, there are two reasons. The first one is that if you look at the two main portals in, in citizen science, like Zooniverse and also CIS Theater, um, there are nothing almost nothing related to energy. And those initiatives that uh, are labeled uh, under uh, energy, well, uh, in my, the previous talk, um, you, uh, you were commented on that. What is citizen science and what is not citizen science? For me, citizen, sci well, citizen science is a very broad concept, but uh, one of the main uh, important points is that have, have to have an impact on science. And the initiatives, some initiatives uh, recorded and the, and the size started are not meeting the, this point. Just we found one of them, uh, that is the Nova Energy Lab, but it's just one example. So we decided to, to go uh, to explore citizen science in energy. And the second reason is because photovoltaics is, for me, is a synonym of citizen science because see, um, photovoltaics is the unique democratic energy that we have. Usually citizens are in the, in the energy sectors, citizens are considered like an end user. We have to accept what others decide we have to accept. But photovoltaics is different. You can decide if you want to install this energy or you don't want to install this energy in your own home. So uh, this is the concept of democracy. This is the concept of citizen science, the democracy of, of, of citizen of science. Sorry. So uh, the maybe um, fr from our experience, the most important was that we developed the the process of coming up with a citizen science initiative in a very responsible way. And what does responsible means? I uh, mean, um, responsible for me means that we integrated from the minute zero, from the starting point, to uh, different stakeholders in our uh, design process. The first thing that we did was uh, uh, prepare a survey and um, we interviewed uh, 100 research groups uh, that uh, gave us the hints, the hints on how citizens could improve their own research. What kind of skills, know-how, data um, coming from, from, from citizens could improve the, the research of different uh, groups uh, involving in uh, photovoltaics? Uh, the responses of such um, uh, survey uh, are openly uh, available in this uh, link, if you want to, to check it. 
Uh, later on, we pass uh, this um, um, request from, from science to uh, different stakeholders, citizens, open science practitioners, uh, or anyone who was motivated to, to take part on a hackathon. On a hackathon that um, um, joined uh, 71 participants in 30 teams representing 16 countries. Okay, uh, they were not researchers. They were they, they weren't the researchers to whom we ask the, uh, how to engage people. We gave to these people the responses, and from from these responses, they had to build uh, the citizen science initiative with their ideas, with their know-how, with their experiences in other uh, engagement activities. And after a week, uh, we received uh, 12 proposals that were evaluated by a multidisciplinary committee uh, and we selected a winner uh, because we only had um, a budget to, to set one city science initiative. Um, uh, the, the winning proposal came from uh, Marta Victoria that is working at the University of Paris in Denmark. Um, well, the initiative is the open database of rooftop solar PV installations. And uh, of course, we developed such a web app focused on the winning proposal. That is Greco. What is the result? The result is an open database with uh, that um, joins uh, the technical characteristics of domestic PV installations. Okay, this uh, data are not available for researchers, and it's very very important in order to us. Model, modeling the, the new scenarios for the energy transition. And this is closed because the companies, the electric, electrical companies has the data and they don't want to share uh, this data with the rest of, of, of the society. Despite this data are coming from, uh, from people, okay? People that is willing to, to people that are willing to, to share the, the, the results. In addition, Greco, sorry, uh, Generation Solar, is um, it's an app where um, uh, you can contact with even if you don't have a, a solar installation in your home at your home you can contact with somebody in your role in your in, in your in your country or in in your region in order to ask and and uh, and, and give uh, and ask for 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 a piece of advice on how the installation is working uh, who uh, installed the installation uh, if uh, you have uh, had some problem with installation, how many savings you are uh, getting with the installation, these kind of questions that uh, a consumer and end user usually have and don't know to, uh, doesn't know to, to whom ask these kind of questions, okay? This is why uh, we said uh, that uh, Generation Solan also allows community creation. Currently, we have, uh, well, this is, um, uh, this is not update. We have uh, almost uh, 140 installation right now, um, uh, representing more than uh, 2,000 kilowatts. Okay, and uh, well, these are the technical uses. How uh, researchers are going to use the data that people are um, including in uh, the generation solar uh, for their research. Okay, I'm not going to to explain to you. Uh, each of them because it's very technical. Um, of course, we are uh, focused on distributed uh, installation, domestic installation, no large plants of photovoltaics. And the last point is disseminate the initiative in the community. And this is the hardest part in my, in my, in my experience uh, from citizen science, because um, you have to engage people and you have to combine people uh, to, to spend time uh, on your initiative. And this is very time consuming. Um, well, uh, it's our duty, we have to do it, uh, but maybe is the, um, here um, uh, is the key of a success, of a successful uh, citizen science initiative. Well, this is uh, all that I, I wanted to share with you about Greco and Generation Solar. And now uh, I'm going just to share with you uh, this new initiative. 
This is Aurora. Uh, Aurora is a project that we presented in January to the European Commission in the last call of Horizon 2020. Uh, we uh, presented the idea and we, um, um, we were against 108 proposals, but we have win. <laughs> this is the good news. Um, uh, Aurora is, um, is a concept in which uh, also we sit in, uh, we, we again uh, are working on, on photovoltaics, but we are taking the idea of uh, the new legal figure in Europe of um, energy communities, and our idea is to um, upgrade uh, social communities, any kind of social community, in example, uh, a campus, okay, a campus with their uh, professors, with their with uh, the assistant staff, uh, with uh, students, uh, and create a, an energy community, which uh, main objective is to become a near zero emission community, okay. Uh, there are different initiatives uh, involved uh, around the, the, um, the, the concept, but the, the final objective is to change the, the, the behavior of, of uh, individuals and also of uh, communities uh, related to energy. Uh, well, just I want to say that the concept of uh, energy community uh, you, you may think, well, this is something similar to the energy cooperatives. It's similar, but it's not equal. Uh, energy co cooperatives only looks for the profit, okay? You invest and you want to win, uh, to, to earn money. Uh, with the concept of energy communities, uh, you uh, have to look for something else than profits. You have to have another kind of benefits. This, this concept allows us just to, um, to, in example, to crowdfund, we are going to crowdfund uh, in my campus, uh, in Vallecas, uh, at the UPM, UPM campus, uh, a 200 kilowatts uh, photovoltaic installation made with investment from students, just uh, starting at 20 euros, very, very cheap shares. So everybody can start to, uh, um, to taking part of the uh, energy transitions. Well, uh, I think that uh, my, my time is over, Eva, so I don't know if you want me to yes. explain more. Or... It, is, it is always very hard for me to interrupt you because you are so enthusiastic and you have such a good ideas to engage with citizens. Uh, oh, actually, we are absolutely on time now. I will just give a couple of minutes to the students to interact with you guys and thinking on their own uh, realities or their own uh, projects or something. There are any questions there for Anna uh, or just for Ancho or even for Andrea that she, she's also here with us and is in, uh, chiming in in the chat. We just uh, the last discussion is about winning or, or not winning projects on citizen science. But now in the new Horizon Europe, it will be a transversal evaluation in, within the, the excellence criteria about the citizen science involvement when it is um, appropriate, because that will be a, another issue. Sometimes people will involve citizens or their family members just because they, they were asked to, to do it. Um, if you can go to the chat, I think there are some questions, Anna. You said that the panels can be purchased Personally, um, you are uh, no. Um, you are going to take part of a community that is going to buy the panels, the installation, uh, and going to sell the electricity to the university. And the university is going to pay the energy community for this electricity, for this renewable en energy uh, that is going to to generate. But uh, the energy community and the installation is just an excuse. Okay, this is the, um, the, um, the way we, we are going to engage people in other activities like the creation of devices with Arduino, uh, the creation of TV roadmaps uh, with uh, people, uh, well, a lot of creation of infrastructures, made, homemade infrastructures like uh, electric chargers for uh, scooters uh, at the campus, uh, and this kind of initiative in order to change the behaviors uh, related to energy. 
So, well, you are going to have a share of minimum 20 euros in a collective um, installation. And the second question, I have a question in citizen science only access to citizen. Uh, this might be an interesting question also for Andrea. And I think it's a fantastic question. Actually, in the US at the beginning, they didn't want to use the term citizen science. They won't try to community science or something like that because of the strong uh, meaning that has citizen and citizenship for the countries. But perhaps, Andrea, you can elaborate a bit more on this. Yeah, that's a, that's a lively discussion. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's true. But, uh, I, I think uh, we have to be able to be flexible as well with the concept. So in Latin America, we use more the concept of participatory science. And, and we, we really think uh, that there, that resonates more with the, um, oh, sorry, with the citizens, so with, the, with everyone. So different stakeholders and different people. And I just know, I haven't read it, but Karen Cooper, who is a, advocate for citizen science for many, many years. She, she wrote uh, some reflections about this and uh, yeah, so don't, so calling to not get stuck with the concept, but uh, moving forward, but at the same time acknowledging these this, uh, details that are not details for different people. So to find out the best suitable approach and concept depending on the community and the local context. Yeah. Well, so uh, I think it's another another question on uh, is with the fact in not sharing at this moment utilities data is due to the international competition, especially China. Not, uh, not totally. Uh, it's because energy has been an oligopoly, and companies doesn't want to to share any data. Data at the end is power. And they feel that they, if they share the data, um, they are going to, to, to lose power. I'm not totally agree with this uh, approach, but companies, uh, this, is the traditional, this is the traditional way of working with companies, and maybe this is the, the, the great challenge of open data, of open data and try to, uh, when, when you, you are working with uh, public funds, Try to make open all your 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 data because uh, it's the way in which we can go further. If everybody close their data, we are spending a lot of resources in doing the same, in in going around the same content once and again. And that's the problem. Okay. And the second question, Ama. Uh, well, in fact, uh, the project uh, was notified uh, uh, ten days ago that was approved. Uh, we are going to start by autumn. But now uh, I'm going to, to tell you my, my, my email. So please write me an email and I'll inform you as soon as uh, we have uh, some information about uh, Aurora. Okay, thank you very much, Felen. Thank you very much, Andrea, Ancho. I think this discussion will last forever because there are so many interesting topics to, to discuss about. But it will just uh, um, um, tell you that we have another slot of discussion at one. Uh, you know this, uh, I, for the, the, the speakers today that they don't know it, this course now integrates with a series of Open Science Cafe that we are organizing for the whole university. So now the students of the PhD, they go to the other room, which is this one that I put it in the chat. And we have a speaker every day for discussion. And it's something like a 30 minutes, this uh, 30 minutes presentation and 30 minutes of discussion that probably if you if you want to join us, it will be fantastic because it will be also about citizen science. We try to align the topic of the of the lesson of the PhD uh, course with the topic of the Open Science Cafe. And today we will have Tiberius Aignat that he has been working um, with, uh, um, you know, probably him, uh, Andrea. He has been working with Muki and with all of these people more in the library uh, science connection and the citizen science in libraries like the, the Southern Denmark University. They have excellent experiments. It's everything that is dealing with uh, citizen science is super inspiring. So let's see there, grab a coffee, grab a lunch or whatever you want and see you at one. Thank you again. Thank you very much, everybody.
Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, thank thank you Valentina, for the opportunity. And I'm very happy bye, you bye. organized this course so nicely. Bye bye. We, we will organize more, but we'll be back again. <laughs> thank you. Okay, bye, thanks. Bye.